I realized recently that I haven't done a tutorial on the ins and outs of contact forms and how to style those contact forms. For those of you who visit museresources.com on the library widgets page, you've probably seen the forms that you can download, the pre-styled forms that you can download into your widgets library in Adobe Muse. For those of you who are not familiar with museresources.com, if you want inspiration for creating forms through this tutorial, uh, that's not a bad place to start because these are some highly stylized forms that will give you some idea of what's possible within Adobe Muse. But I'm also going to take this opportunity to show you what's possible in styling these forms with Adobe Muse and what's not possible. So to start, I'm going to open up the widgets library. And that's not the library. That's the widgets library. The library is where you install stuff. So if you were to download one of these forms from museresources.com, when you install it, it shows up on the library. The widgets library, on the other hand, is where you will find the forms that are built in, the blank forms. And I'm going to start with the simple contact form. There's also a detailed contact form. It's the same thing, but with more fields for people to fill in. And with simple contact form, you can add as many fields as you want. So I'm going to drop that in there just to start with something more simple. Now I'm going to close the widgets library and scroll down a little bit. And here we have our basic form. Now, I want to help you guys understand, first and foremost, how to style these forms and how that works. Uh, because it's a little bit clumsy, to be perfectly honest with you guys. And the reason it's a little bit clumsy is because there are all these different states. There's a different state for when you've clicked in a box. There's a different state for when your cursor's on top of a box. There's a different state for when you're nowhere near a box. Uh, and mastering those states and styling those states is really what makes the form uh, look and feel the way you want it to and to be confused by that makes it really difficult to edit these forms. So the first thing to know is if you want to modify the fields that are in the form you can start with this little blue circle and that shows my form options where I can add standard fields or I can add custom fields down below uh, and then it also allows me to determine a name for this form and where it gets sent off to. Now the name of the form is especially important if you have more than one website or more than one page on your website that contain a contact form uh, because this is how you're going to know when it gets emailed to you where it came from. If you don't put a name on it or if you title every form the same way, you won't know which form it is. You might not know which website it's from. So it is important to give the form a name and not to just leave it on uh, home form or whatever the default name is. It will actually automatically try to help you name the form based on the name of the page that the form is found on. So mine says home form because this page is actually called home. So it tries to help you. but bottom line is if you don't know what it's called you could end up confused later so give it a name. Email to is where you put your own email address or if this is for a client you put your clients email address. A lot of you are downloading these contact forms and you are leaving my email address in there and uh, I've been getting your uh, emails from your websites so please switch that to your own email address uh, so that way I stop getting your emails. If you guys want to email me, that's totally fine. Feel free to email me. If you guys have questions, I do my best to keep up with the questions, but just be aware, I get a ton of them. So I'm not going to try to hide my email address from you guys. Now here it says, after sending, stay on current page. That allows me to either bring the viewer to a different web page confirming that they've successfully contacted me, or I can have it uh, keep them on the current page and it'll just say a little message like success. Now, where does that message come from, and what does that message even say? That has to do with the state for the entire form. So when I say for the entire form, this has to do with making uh, your selection on this form. And what I mean by that is if I click away and I click once on this form, I have the entire form selected. And if you're not sure what you have selected, if you're not sure how many times you've clicked, I always say when in doubt, click away and click back on it once. But it also says in the top left corner, form, normal. That means I have the entire form selected. If I click again up here on this name field, it now says form field because I have one specific field selected versus having the entire form selected. It's important to know what you have selected. Now the third level deep is if I click again, I can actually select the text input or the label. There are two separate pieces if I click again. Uh, so I could delete the label, I could change the label, I could delete the entire text input field, I could change what's written in the text input field. Uh, so I've got three levels of control to take. I'm going to click away though and I'm going to click back on it once to select the entire form. In the top left corner it says form. And where it says normal, I'm going to show you guys there are four separate states. 
The normal is what the form looks like when nothing special is going on. Then there's submit in progress. Submit in progress by default grays out the submit button because the submit is already in progress. There's no need to hit submit again. And there's this little hidden text box that appears that says submitting form. Now you can double click on that. You can type whatever you want in there. You could say submit in progress. You could say whatever on earth you want it to say. And then submit success is what you'll see if you don't reroute people to another page, if you just want to show them that their submit was successful and keep them on the current page uh, as per the default within Adobe Muse. Now there's also submit error. Submit error is if the server has an error, not if somebody typed something in wrong. If somebody typed something in wrong, you will get uh, sort of a field specific error, which you guys get to uh, customize in, in a later step. So submit error here is if the server failed to deliver this contact form, if there was either an issue with the server that's permanent or temporary uh, that does not allow the form to send the way the code is intended to make it send. Uh, so you can customize all three of these so they say something different or so the text is bigger and more scary on the error or the submit in progress is green instead of just gray to show that things are going according to plan. Uh, totally up to you guys, but just know that there are four separate states to the entire form as a whole. Now I'm going to click into one of these fields, like name for instance. Now it says form field in the top left corner. And if I click on empty, you can see that there are now five states. There are five different states for this individual field. And by default, if I make a change to one of these, it will make the change to all of the fields on the form. So I'm going to change name, email, and message all at the same time. Now when I click from empty to non-empty to rollover you guys will see these subtle little changes taking place and uh, the reason these subtle little changes are taking place is because Adobe by default has set us up with differentiated states so that we can tell these things apart. Uh, it was nice of them but if you want to restyle these things you'll probably do away with all of what Adobe has done. Starting with empty Empty is what you see if the field hasn't been clicked on, if the mouse is not on top of the field. It's basically if the form is not being touched or interacted with, what does it look like? That's what empty is all about. It's the default state. Non-empty, on the other hand, is if a field is not selected, if you're not typing in the field, but you have already typed something into the field. By default, it goes a solid black color, but there's still a gray stroke around the outside. Then there's rollover. That's what it looks like when your cursor is on top of the field. That's uh, that the cursor has gone on top of the field and it's sort of lighting up in a way to indicate that uh, it's ready for you to click on it or that it's clickable in the first place. And then there's focus. And focus is what happens if you do click on the field and you've placed the computer's focus in that field. Uh, focus is also important for those who use alternate input devices, uh, like just the keyboard, people who don't use the mouse or can't use a mouse. Uh, focus is what you see when you tab from one field to another to show that you're in that field. So focus is another really important one. And then error. Error is what you see if there's a problem with that particular field when the user hits submit. If there's a problem with the name field or the email field, if it's an invalid email address, that's what you're going to see. Uh, so you could change that up to look however you like. Uh, now another thing to note is as you're making changes here, some of these things get inherited. So for instance, I've got, I've clicked again and I now have this text input field selected and I'm going to click up here on the toolbar to round the corners of this box. You can see that all of the corners became rounded except the submit button because they do all edit together, which is nice. It's going to save me a lot of time. But you'll also notice if I go from empty to non-empty that it's still rounded. That inherits, that style gets inherited from one to the next to the next. That doesn't go for every, everything. If I, for instance, make the text here uh, a lighter shade of gray or something like that. Let me go over and do an even lighter shade of gray. You can see that that happens on all of them, but it doesn't get inherited into the next state. If I go to non-empty, non-empty has its own text color associated with it. Uh, so it's important to know that sometimes some things get inherited from one to the next and sometimes they don't. Another thing that I like to do, I like to make these text fields a little bit bigger. I like to make all the text a little bit bigger. Um, if I do that on empty, if I go and change the size to 18 for instance and I go to non-empty, that does get inherited. So the text color might not be inherited but the text size should be inherited by default and I like to have that bigger text size. 
Um, another thing that you can do is change the font for the entire form, and the best way to do that is to click away from the form, click back on the form once to select the entire form, and then to make your font change. So if I make that font change, it affects everything, including the submit button, um, so I don't have to backtrack. Now if I do go in and I set a form field to be a different font on error, um, that is going to override whatever font change I make for the overall form. Um, so just be aware that, again, not everything is inherited and specificity always wins. If you are specifically setting a font for a specific state, then it will stay that specific font for that specific state because uh, if specific, doubt is removed. Uh, from the application so it, it tries to figure out what you're trying to do and if you're trying to do something that doesn't make sense well you might get a result that doesn't make sense and that would be your fault apologies for being blunt but the software and the computer can only be so smart and can only make so many decisions on our behalf so now that I've got my form created and now that I've got sort of a, a style set to it uh, I didn't change much. <laughs> Again, you guys, it's up to you guys to change everything, uh, every aspect of the form, uh, but I want you guys to be familiar with the states. One thing that I didn't realize at first that I'm really stoked about is if you guys do have an icon or a graphic, for instance, I have the icon mega pack installed here from museresources.com. If I go and grab an icon, let me find one for name, I like this little contact group with these little people. If I drop this in here and I make it good and small, let me get this out of the way. If I make it good and small, so small that it could fit inside of that field, then the next thing I can do, uh, sure, I can position it over here, but what I want to do is I'm actually going to hit cut, which on my Mac is Command X, would be Control X on your PC. You could also always go to Edit and choose Cut. And when I do that, I can click into this field several times where I'm able to type what I want this field to say. And I'm going to go to the beginning of it. I'm going to leave it as enter name, but I'm going to hit paste. And when I hit paste, it gives me my little icon. My little icon is now in there with the text. And it doesn't have to be blue. I mean, blue is the default color. Um, but I can go and I can select my regular selection tool and I can click on that. I can change the color at any time. These. Uh, the icon mega pack, the icons in the icon mega pack are recolorable from the effects panel at the top uh, on the glow tab. So I could say that I want to make this, uh, for instance, let's go with like a, a grayish, not too gray, but you know, visible. And now, because it's inside the text field, if I go and preview this in the browser, where it says enter name, it shows my little icon, I can click and the whole thing actually goes away. So I can type in place of it. So it's a good call to action. It's very inviting. It helps give people an idea of what goes in that field, especially if you're using a more specific uh, sort of icon. If I go and find, for instance, there is a male icon in here somewhere. There are 400 icons in here, so there are plenty to go through. Okay, here's like a loudspeaker, for instance. If I drag in the loudspeaker, and I make that smaller. Let me go ahead and make it real small. I can also go over to here where I've got this icon and uh, when you drop in an icon it creates a graphic style for recolorable icon so I could go down here and redefine the style and it will make any of the icons that I drop in match one another. So now that I've redefined that style make this about the right size I can cut that and I can go in here in the message box put the little loudspeaker in there and nudge the text over and now I've got two of those down so uh, you guys can see that it really creates a more attractive contact form I mean it's just plain welcoming um, I wish I could find my little uh, email icon there's a little envelope here we go solid envelope let me drop that in there see it automatically turns gray because I redefine the style I'll make it nice and small I'll cut it click into here and you'll notice I'm, I'm just kind of not being precise at all, but it looks like they do all match approximately in size. Now the reason I'm doing this and focusing on this so much is because sometimes your alignment's a little off or you won't be satisfied with how the icon is spaced from the top or from the left. Uh, and that's really the last styling element that I want to talk about here. It's not so obvious because you'll probably spend time on the text panel trying to figure out the spacing, trying to figure out the before paragraph and after paragraph spacing. That's not where it is. There is a separate spacing panel in Adobe Muse. And if you can't find that separate spacing panel, then go to Window and then look for Spacing. 
to make sure spacing is turned on. And you'll find a little window like this that talks about padding. Now padding is the space between the inside border of a shape, like these rounded rectangles. That inside border and the content. So how big is that gap? How close are these things allowed to get to the edge? You can see here that these things are pretty close to the edge, but I might want to nudge them in from the left. Not necessarily down from the top, but in from the left. Now padding has this little lock in the middle. It's this little, uh, it's like a chain. And I can click on that to unlock it, to break the link between left, top, right, and bottom. And I can now increase the left padding to nudge these things inward a little bit. So that's where that's hiding. That's where that space is getting created from. Before I had discovered the spacing panel, there were all sorts of little widgets within Adobe Muse that were giving me seemingly mysterious spacing. And uh, once I got that figured out, I've had many fewer headaches within Adobe Muse with these forms and such. So I hope that helps. I hope all of this helps, really. Uh, you guys will notice that I have not stylized this form in any sort of beautiful way. Uh, but I hope that I have sh shown you <clears throat> and given you the tools uh, to be able to style these forms yourself. And I do hope to get more downloadable forms on museresources.com. So if you guys like this tutorial, please subscribe. I have more cool stuff coming soon. Hopefully I can save you guys some time, help you guys get your work done faster. And uh, if you're doing this for clients, hopefully I can help you make more money.